I'm delighted tonight to, um, to start our um, regular session of our webinar, Mega Online Course. Um, uh, I'm delighted to introduce my excellent colleague as moderator tonight, uh, Prof. Tolo Alogo. He's a professor of pain medicine in uh, Canada. Uh, I know him for the last 15 years. He's one of my excellent colleagues. He's my, my relation to him is beyond that. We are just a colleagues in anesthesia. We are very close friends. And he's always very good supportive to myself personally and to this online, uh, MEGA online course and the MEGA Medical Academy. Uh, Brof Tolo, thank you very much for coming to control this session tonight. And you are very welcome, all, the, all you. My for pleasure, your... sir. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to um, today's tonight presentation. Um, we have some every weight that will be speaking to us tonight um, in person of Dr. Um, Ellen Girazi and Dr. Aisa as well. They'll be speaking to us on different topics. I'm just going to um, Clive and Don Jones to just um, introduce the two speakers tonight. I'm going to start um, with our first speaker for tonight. She's going to be talking to us about post thoracotomy pain syndrome. Um, in person of um, Dr. Ellen Garazzi. Um, she completed her MD at the Marshall University uh, Medical Science, and she holds the postdoctoral studies in anesthesiology in German University of Medicine. Um, she got a pain fellow degree from Tehran University of Medical Science from Iran, and she holds a fellowship of the interventional pain practice from Texas Tech University and the USA. Um, she's a private consultant in pain medicine in Iran. Um, she has published so many books and many papers about pain management in repeated journals. Um, she is serving also as an editorial board in so many journals as well. She has been invited to speak at so many meetings, both international and local meetings. Um, she's a pioneer on ultrasound guidance spine injection, and she's participated as a faculty and trainer in so many cadaver workshops and ultrasound, both ultrasound guided and fluoroscopy guided pain injection. She constantly contributes to the growth of pain medicine worldwide. Um, it's my honor and pleasure um, to. Um, I have Dr. Garazzi speak to us tonight about post thoracotomy pain syndrome. So you can all have your questions ready. Um, this is one area I have um, very so much interest in, in terms of managing patients that had thoracic surgery or even have breast surgery that still develop um, post thoracotomy pain. Uh, she's going to talk to us tonight about the atopathogenesis, how this patient present, and also the investigation and all the interventional approaches in managing this pain. So um, I hand you over to Dr. Garazzi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for introducing me. This is an honor for me to help for improvement of pain education in Egypt. Uh, hi, everyone. I wish you are uh, safe and well. Uh, I know this webinar series are really an uh, inspiration and motivation journey for us in this difficult pandemic time. In fact, I have been invited to Egypt many times, but uh, I was not lucky enough to see your beautiful and historical country. And I would like to thank Dr. Sadmati for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, this was uh, really a good aspect of pandemic that uh, breaking barrier and brought us closer together. And Dr. Saad Mahdi asked me to talk about chronic pain. And also he asked me to talk about uh, intercostal nerve block and paravertebral block. So I choose this topic for you, post pain syndrome. Uh, Post-operative pain in as acute pain associated with surgical trauma accompanied by inflammatory process and diminishing severity by tissue healing. Thoracotomy is one of the most painful surgical procedures now because many muscles, many bones, joint, neurovascular structure, fascia, and parietal nerve are pain-sensitive structure and injury during the incision. 
And then nociceptive stimuli generate during the surgery is transmitted to upper cortex. We are often originating from this structure and lead to chronic pain. And the chronic pain is that make any treatment many difficult. Can you share your screen, please? Is your screen shared? Uh, I don't know. I could not. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. When we tell post thoracotomy pain syndrome, when it lasts about two months after thoracic uh, resection. Oh, Helen, I don't see is... your screen share. Yes. I don't see your yes, screen yes, share. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay, okay, okay. Okay. According to okay. associated study of the pain, they say that two months is enough. Uh, we have many other uh, lectures when say three or six months, you know, three or six months is most of time for chronic pain, but for post pain syndrome, two months is enough. And the pain is moderate to severe, typically numbing, tingling, burning, shooting. We have local pain and also we have radicular pain. This is very important. In post pain syndrome, you have radicular pain, even shooting pain, even. You have allodynia, you have uh, hypersensitivity, you have hypoesthesia, all that you will see in, in a kind of neuropathic pain. For the first time during the World War II in 1944, they uh, introduced this syndrome. And the incidence of it is very different according to the lecture. Maybe uh, you have seen 20, uh, 10, but in the recent revolution in the two, uh, 2020, uh, they reported 33 to 91% after thoracic surgery. And this wide variety, this is because of the risk factor for this syndrome and many BIAs that will happen during the study of the incidence of the syndrome. About the etiology, you know, we have an injury. We have injury due to incision of the thrust. And this cause a uh, rupture of the muscle, fascia, injured the joint. We have two, three kinds of the joint in a spine, in thoracic region. We have costochondral joint, costovertebral joint, costotransverse joint. We have even facet joint during the resection and uh, during the uh, manipulation in the thoracic region may be some strain on this joint and even dislocation of the disjoint may cause uh, the pain, even chronic pain. And uh, even uh, in thoracic region is a special site in the body because you have a radicular nerve. This is the only site in the body that ventral root leave the uh, intervertebral foramen and pass under the ribs, a unique pass. And there is no plexus. We have not lumbar plexus or sacral plexus. We have uh, intercostal nerve uh, independent each other, pass under the ribs. And this nerve is near to visceral organ, near to uh, lung, near to parietal nerve. So it's possible that during the surgery or even when you enter a chest tube may uh, injure the pleura and uh, there is possibility of visceral pain in uh, post pain syndrome also. And the most common reason for post pain syndrome is intercostal nerve injury. There are many risk factors for this syndrome, as I told you before. Many different from perioperative factor, surgical factor, and postoperative factor. Uh, Perioperative factor, for example, if a person is young, uh, uh, she or he has more chance to have post pain syndrome. Is uh, If uh, your patient is female, uh, there is more possibility of post pain syndrome. And uh, there is also genetic predisposition for this syndrome. And some patients who have pain disorder, for example, fibromyalgia or psychological factor contribute to higher prevalence of post pain syndrome. And most important, presence of 
duration and severity of the preoperative pain is a risk factor for, for post-thoracotomy pain syndrome, as all of you know this, and surgical factor. The severity of the pain was determined to be related to the location and length of the incision. This is very important. Location and length of the incision. If the length is longer, the possibility of post thoracotomy pain syndrome is more. Because of this, in video assisted thoracic surgery, the incidence of uh, post thoracotomy pain syndrome is lower, even half lower compared as you see the incidence. And the location is also important. Uh, they reported that uh, anterolateral and median sternotomy has less pain compared to postrolateral incision. And uh, we have also postoperative factor. Uh, as an anesthesiologist, because I know most of you are anesthesiologists, you know uh, control of the pain after surgery is very important. If you control the pain better, the possibility of postrolateral pain syndrome is less. And always they use multimodal technique, use uh, medication, drug, many drugs, even ketamine, even gabapentin, even NSAID, even astaminophen, all of them, and regional anesthesia together and help the patient to improve postoperative pain to prevent postoperative pain syndrome. This is very, very important because uh, pain after uh, thoracic surgery is very severe, more severe than many of uh, incision. Uh, so if you control it better, the possibility of post pain syndrome is lesser. And we have also we have also uh, possibility of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, uh, and tumor recurrence, always think to tumor recurrence after a patient comes to you with uh, an incision in thorax, you see the incision and say, yes, this is post thoracotomy pain syndrome, but it's possibility that you have a tumor which recurrent. And prolonged hospitalization. Prolonged hospitalization and its psychological effect as a reason of post thoracotomy pain syndrome. So we have many, many risk factors. About the pathophysiology, although the pathophysiology of post pain syndrome is not yet been fully uh, elucidated, it is known that it is a complex pain, neuropathic pain, nociceptive pain, and visceral pain. This is very important. We have a surgical trauma here. As you see, there is a surgical trauma here. It released nociceptive uh, factor. For example, substance B, calcium generated peptide, ulotamod, NMDA activated. And they sent a response from here to uh, dorsal root and then to contralateral spinal cord and comes to lumbic system and cortex. And we have also, after any trauma, change in the genetics. And all of them so, uh, impose patient to hypersensitivity to pain. We have extra discharge from the nerve. We have change in threshold of the sodium channel because of release of glutamine on other neurotransmitter. And all of them uh, change the reception field of the prefrontal nerve and spinal cord and central system. And we have primary sensitization and central sensitization, and all of them is a mechanism for neuropathic pain. And this is the neuropathic pain which make treatment of the post thoracotomy pain syndrome very difficult. And also we have visceral pain, as I told you, because in thoracic region, we have visceral organ. We have a frail nerve, we have vagus nerve, and this cause visceral pain in this patient. When a patient comes with uh, thoracic pain and refer to your pain clinic, this is very important that you know, although this patient comes with the SCAR history of thoracotomy, but, but you always must think about differential diagnosis. As I told you, maybe a recurrence of the cancer. So, because although pain thoracic syndrome are rare, about 5% of the patient who refer to pain clinic come with thoracic pain, but all this patient must be truly examined because of important underlying pathology. When a patient refer to you, 
with uh, a scar of thoracotomy and pain, first of all, you think about uh, post thoracotomy pain syndrome or post mastectomy pain syndrome, or after chronic RT bypass grafting, sternotomy, midline sternotomy also cause uh, post thoracotomy pain syndrome. But always you have to think about the referral pain from internal organ, internal organ, even into the abdomen, from renal organ, from esophageal, from, from pancreas, all of them may cause uh, thoracic pain. And spine related pain, for example, vertebral body, you may have fracture due to metastasis or even due to osteoporosis. Uh, and patient refer to thoracic pain and even have an scar. But maybe this pain is because of the thoracic uh, vertebral fracture, not because of the scar. So think about this and intervertebral disc and facet joint. And rib related pain, this is very, very important. Even we have a manipulation of rib, even fracture of the rib during the surgery, and this is caused post thoracotomy pain syndrome, but patient may have other syndrome. As a pain specialist, you have to know many pain, uh, chronic pain syndrome in thorax. You must study hard. For example, costoesternal syndrome, Tietz syndrome, malleable external joint pain, external syndrome, zifoidalgia, slippery syndrome, costovertebral joint syndrome, 12 ref syndrome, all of them related to ribs. And a patient referred to you with a scar, but maybe this syndrome. Please uh, uh, study about differential diagnosis of thoracic pain. And as I told you before, maybe recurrence of the cancer, or maybe even chest wall pain due to cancer, mesothelioma, Postoperatal syndrome, maybe effusion, maybe pancreas tumor, maybe related to diagnosis procedure or cancer pain treatment. And maybe patient has intercostal neuralgia due to post-herbotic neuralgia and you are confused about the diagnosis. And always you have to think about uh, myofascial pain and latissimus dorsi syndrome. This is uh, some uh, rib-related syndrome that I told you about them because during the surgery, uh, they manipulate the ribs, they have resection of the rib and um, even fracture it. Uh, there is a strain on the joint, joint that uh, connected the rib to the sternum, joint that connected the rib to the transverse process to the vertebral body, you know, ribs comes from anterior to the posterior, from anterior joint to the sternum, from the posterior joint to the vertebral um, by two, two joint, uh, costal transverse joint and costal vertebral joint. All of them may uh, undergo a strain during the surgery. And uh, the patient may comes with costal sternal syndrome, Tayas syndrome, Sibirikin syndrome, and uh, xiphoidalgia, maybe manipulation in mid sternotomy cause trauma to the xiphoid. Uh, all of this syndrome, uh, the pathology of all of this syndrome is not known completely, but in the history of all of them, we have a history of trauma. So it's possible that patient comes with post thoracotomy pain syndrome, have this syndrome uh, compound, uh, scar pain and test syndrome. And I had many patients it's both of them. So a, a good physical examination and uh, understanding this uh, syndrome is very important for management of your patient. Uh, fortunately, thoracic pain syndrome, uh, most of the time is a mild or moderate pain syndrome. And only in 5% of the patient have severe pain. And most of them respond to uh, conservative treatment. All the drug that used for neuropathic pain can use this in this syndrome. And I know you had many conference before about neuropathic pain. Uh, Tercyclic antidepressant, amitriptyline, imipramine are from the first line treatment. And also they help to improve depression of this patient because all the chronic pain patient has uh, mm, some kind of depression because of the pain. Pain is not a good thing. <laughs> and uh, also serotonin or often optic inhibitor antidepressant, venlafaxine and duloxetine, they help for to remove anxiety in this patient also. And uh, anticonvulsant, you know, they are also first line treatment in this patient and um, help patient for sleeping. 
and all of them has a uh, uh, side effect that you know more than me. Antopiramal, which inhibit GABA and NMDA uh, together. And we have also topical drugs like lidocaine, which is very good for allodynia and for focal pain. And about uh, NSAID, there is no evidence for use of NSAID in neuropathic pain and in posterocotomy pain. And opioid, opioid are the uh, strong pain relieving drug which used for uh, as the second or third line for treatment of neuropathic pain. So this is the medication which we, you can use for treatment of the patient when referred to your clinic with postracotomy pain syndrome. But if your patient don't respond to conservation therapy, which may include tens of puncture, even and even botulism toxin injection in the focal point of the pain, mm, you can go to uh, intervention that I know you love it too much. Okay, interventional pain management. Uh, interventional pain management, uh, for the interventional pain management, you must first know about the anatomy. Anatomy is the first step for learning the intervention. So if you want to do the intervention, please first study hard about the anatomy. First of all, you have to know pain syndrome, different pain syndrome in thoracic region. You must be familiar with different pain syndrome in pain clinic. Otherwise, you couldn't help the patient. Then if you want to perform procedure, you must first know anatomy. Anatomy is very important because as you see here, the nerve exits from intervertebral foramen and then give some branches. First, give a posterior branch which go to paraspinal muscle and to the facet joint, anterior branch, which go to the uh, sympathetic uh, gray ramus communicant and sympathetic chain. And then this nerve come here, a lateral branch. You see this lateral branch uh, innervate the muscle and also has uh, uh, branches up to down. Because of this, we say um, there is overlap between intercostal space because of this, when uh, you work as, as the, an anesthesiologist for controlling pain during the surgery, not for chronic pain, you, uh, when you want to use intercostal block, use the uh, block of the incision level and two level up and two level down. This is because of this uh, branch. And we have a small branch, anterior branch here. This is very important because most of the time you don't consider this. This is the branch which gives innervation near to sternum. We see we have many different incision in thoracic region, maybe a small incision here in anterior, maybe midline thoracotomy, even maybe we have a scar of the surgical drainage. In some of my patients, there is no pain here, just pain is here. So be very careful. And if you know the anatomy, you can use it for block because uh, although you know that uh, intercostal block is done six or seven, eight centimeter lateral to the midline, but this is for regional anesthesia, for surgery, not for pain. For pain management, you can block the nerve everywhere. And it depends on the, the patient symptom and pain. For example, in, in this patient, always inject uh, a little lateral to the incision. It's not necessary to inject the posterior and you can perform this procedure in any position, lateral, sitting, no difference, but almost all, all the time as I use supine or prone because I don't like my patient had a uh, vasovagal syndrome. And in this patient, you can block here. You, can, you must block this nerve and lateral to this you can block. And here you must block near to this, maybe T11 uh, or T12. And in this patient, this is for video assist trachoscopy and very a small incision. So the chance of post trachotomy pain syndrome is less. And in this patient and in this patient, this is uh, very painful. This is this cause, this has more incidence of post trachotomy pain syndrome because this is postrolateral. And in this patient, maybe you must use facet joint blood because this is near to the spine. 
This is very near to the spine. Maybe manipulation of the facet joint, maybe manipulation of costovertebral joint, maybe manipulation of costa transfer joint, and most of them may be painful. And even some of the patients refer with this scar, but just complain from chest tube scar. And I had many patients like this. So this is very important that you perform a good physical examination and find the level of the pain and where is the pain. Pain is important, not the scar of the surgery. And uh, I told you about many different uh, procedures you can perform for this patient. Uh, as I told you, the most important cause of the postural academy pain syndrome is intercostal nerve injury. So the best procedure uh, is intercostal nerve block. And this is the simplest one and most effective uh, procedure that you can choose for your patient. Most of the time, I, I just block the intercostal space near to the incision, and some, um, sometimes a level below. And all the time, uh, I consider the uh, uh, where is the incision? It is anterior, it is lateral, it is posterior, and inject uh, lateral to the inc incision. Okay? And uh, selective thoracic nerve root injection. Uh, this choice, when always, when I didn't have re good response from intercostal nerve injection, I use selective nerve root blood, which is very similar to this. Intercostal nerve in thoracic region is the only site in the body that ventral root come under the ribs, and you find it. This is not like lumbar region, you have plexus, lumbar plexus, sacral plexus, no. Uh, this is just under the ribs. And it's not necessary to uh, perform transforaminal blood because of the many complications of transforaminal blood as I uh, wrote about in my book, Safety Recommendation of Ultrasound Guide Spine Injection. I talk about this many times. Uh, so I don't recommend you selective nerve blood in this patient, but even when you have not good response from intercostal nerve block. And uh, thoracic medial blunt block, as I told you before, uh, maybe uh, this is depend on the patient's symptom. If your patient have the uh, facetogenic pain, maybe combine uh, with a scar, you use a uh, medial branch block and paravertebral block. Paravertebral block is near to the spine and midline and is very uh, near to epidural space. So uh, when you use paravertebral block, uh, most of the time this block and epidural block are the block of choice for uh, during the surgery, for uh, pain control during the surgery. But for uh, chronic pain management, post academy pain syndrome, you also can use paravertebral block. But because when you inject in paravertebral space, uh, this space is in, in continuation with epidural space. There is possibility that your drug distribute to the epidural space. So I don't use it in patient with this unstable patient and high risk patient. And the uh, intercostal block is more safe and more easy. Why I, I perform paravertebral block? Sometimes it's necessary to perform paravertebral block, and but most of the time intercostal block is enough. And uh, one good thing for paravertebral blood is that it also block sympathetic chain. And if your patient have visceral pain or sympathetic mediate pain, you can use sympathetic blood, paravertebral blood. And the uh, interpural analgesia, uh, this is always used for during the surgery. Uh, for chronic pain management, rarely use this blood but it's possible to use it, but because of difficult difficulty of incision and possibility of the lung injury, uh, rarely used interprolate analgesia. Thoracic sympathetic blood, as I told you before, we have a stimulation of the phrenic nerve, vagus nerve, we have injury to the lung. So even parietal nerve may be stimulated with the chest tube and we have uh, visceral pain. So we can use a thoracic sympathetic block selectively. When we use paravertebral block, there's possibility that the block the sympathetic chain, but in selectively thoracic sympathetic block, you block the sympathetic chain. And thoracic epidural anesthesia, as you know, this is the choice for uh, uh, post-operative pain control. Very good result from it. Uh, 
But uh, for uh, post-arachidonic pain syndrome, I don't use epidural drug. As I told in my book, I, I, I'm not uh, inject anything in epidural space because of this complication. So I prefer to choose more lateral block. When you fall from epidural space, the complication is less because of this all the time they introduce, for example, erector spine block, pectoralis, serratus anterior prime block. Why? Because they want to be far from epidural space and this complication. So uh, you can use epidural block, but when you have intercostal nerve injection, why use epidural block? And then if you have not enough response from your blood, you can use neurolysis with uh, phenol, with alcohol or radio frequency. Also, I didn't use this then. This is just for patient be, who has a, lot, uh, a short life expectancy. And uh, then you inject in a selective nerve root block and your response is short, you can use uh, dorsal root ganglion pulse radio frequency. In dorsal root ganglion, you just uh, permitted to use pulse radio frequency, not conventional radio frequency. And we can use always, although pulse radio frequency on intercostal nerve, and it's easier, uh, and we have good response. So if you inject intercostal and you had short response, or your patient is not satisfied, you can use pulse radio frequency of intercostal nerve or dorsal root ganglion. But a uh, procedure for uh, dorsal root ganglion is more difficult compared to uh, in, in frequency of intercostal nerve. And a uh, new method of uh, pain control, neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulation, very expensive. And uh, is used when patient is refractory to other treatment, we choose it. And the newer one, uh, dorsal root ganglion stimulation, uh, introduced in 2010, after they uh, didn't receive good response from spinal cord stimulation, they choose uh, dorsal root ganglion stimulation. This is this, uh, very similar to a spinal cord stimulation, and the difference is that they directly stimulate dorsal root ganglion at the level of the pain, at the level of the incision. That's very good response. They found very good response. Okay. Uh, again, review them. Dorsal root ganglion pulse radio frequency. Is it used for neuropathic pain syndrome and help in case where, where a radiculopathy is part of the pain presentation. Thoracic sympathetic blood is used in diagnosis and treatment of cross thoracic pain syndrome, such as neuropathic pain, chest wall pain, and thoracic visceral pain. And neurolysis or radiofrequency ablation used for well-localized severe pain in patient with short life expectancy. I didn't use it. I, no time I use it. And neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is used for chronic well-localized neuropathic pain. A stimulation is just uh, useful for neuropathic pain and used in cancer survivor and with chronic neuropathic pain. And myofascial pain syndrome, this is very important. When you're, we have them in all around the chest, in every muscle we have in the chest. For example, here you see many trigger points. Even in the sternal region, you have this muscle. So you have trigger point here. I had many patients uh, with, uh, for uh, open, thoracic, uh, open heart surgery and pain in sternum. Um, and although I block the uh, intercostal near to the sternum, I always release trigger point. And maybe even in this incision here, you have a trigger point too. So when you inject in intercostal, uh, use uh, uh, trigger point release too when you suspect it to it. Intercostal nerve block today performed with ultrasound, but this is the fluoroscopy technique. 
you see here under the ribs inject and this is spread of the contrast engine with use of ultrasound it's not necessary to use fluoroscope because the only the most important advantages of ultrasound is in thoracic region because one of the most important complication of the injection in thoracic region is ponomatrox. So when you can see pleb and lung tissue with uh, ultrasound technique, why use fluoroscopy? But some patient may use fluoroscopy. This is this technique. And this is thoracic nerve root injection near the intervertebral foramen. And always use for a dorsal root ganglion pulse radio frequency. In refractory cases, I use it. And this is a thoracic sympathetic block here in T3 for patient who have visceral pain. Uh, you can use this technique. And this is facet joint block, medial branch block, when patient have the symptom of acetogenic pain, although he has also uh, scar pain and posturacotomy pain. And this is a spinal cord stimulation at T3 for a patient, 60 years old patient. This is a case report with posturacotomy for 20 years. This is very interesting because posturacotomy pain relieved during the time. Uh, but this patient had the pain and respond very good to a spinal cord stimulation. This is dorsal root ganglion stimulation. Uh, in a, a spinal cord stimulation, they enter the lead into the posterior epidural space. You know, we have posterior epidural space and anterior epidural space. For a spinal cord stimulation, you enter the needle in posterior uh, epidural space. But in dorsal root ganglion stimulation, you enter your lead into the epidural space and conduct it into the anterior epidural space, then enter it to the foramen and stimulate dorsal root ganglion, selectively uh, uh, inhibit the pain transmission. Okay. Uh, now, Technique. I know most of you love technique. Uh, I want to uh, uh, consider both technique as unique one to simply teach you. Uh, in my idea, both technique are one technique because you see here, this is the ribs, yes? As I told you, you can perform intercostal blood, anterior, lateral, and posterior. This is posterior one. And you see this muscle up to ribs. And this is transverse process. Transverse process is near to the midline. This is ribs, and here is transverse process, okay? This is vertebra. We have also this muscle. The only difference is this space. Okay, in this space, you have three muscle and all of you know them. External intercostal muscle, internal intercostal muscle, and innermost intercostal muscle. For intercostal nerve block, you inject between internal intercostal muscle and innermost intercostal muscle. Okay, so if you consider, this is here, this is uh, inter inner Inter, innermost intercostal muscle and the nerve and exit here and this is costovertebral uh, ligament, okay? If you consider that internal intercostal, intercostal muscle ligament extend to costal transverse ligament, this is, would be very simple for you. Here you inject here and here you inject under the costal transverse ligament. I explain it more for you later. Okay, see? For intercostal nerve block, you always, for a thoracic injection, use linear probe. This is enough because the ribs 
even uh, transfers process are very superficial. superficial. So a uh, linear probe is enough. Uh, you put uh, in this technique, you put probe longitudinally for both of them, for intercostal block and for para, uh, paravertebral block. Yes, see, the only difference is that put it here on the ribs and in this technique, put it on the transverse process. And if you are very similar, you see, as I told in every webinar, that uh, when ultrasound wave received to a hard structure, for example, ribs or bone, uh, it couldn't pass. So it produced a hyper echogenicity up to the bone and hypoechogenicity or acoustic shadow under. So this is the acoustic shadow of the rib. And notice this run line. And this is the muscle between them. And this hyperechoic line is pleb. It's very helpful for diagnosis the pleb. You see the pleb, so you will not penetrate into it. The complication of this uh, injection. And here you see the transverse process put probe again longitudinally and here. This is transverse process, okay? And look this line up to the down. This is costal transverse ligament. And in a good view of ultrasound with a good quality of your instrument, you can see this as a oblique line, hyper equic line here, okay? I will show you in other pictures. So you can consider both techniques as one technique, yes? Your probe is here and move it toward here, and so you have our vertebral block, very similar. I know most of you know how to perform intercostal block. So if you know intercostal block, you can perform paravertebral block, no difference. When you want to perform intercostal block, this is a schematic one, this is not you know, for a real person. Put your probe on the ribs. Uh, and consider that the space that you want to inject be in the middle of your probe. This is your probe, must be in the mid, middle of your probe, the space that you want to inject. And it's better that you have two ribs in your view because it helps you to perform your procedure and then enter your needle toward the here. Please look at this schematic picture and memorize them. It's very important. Sorry, Dr. Garazi, just about five minutes more. Okay. You see, this is the muscle. This is the vessel between internal intercostal muscle and innermost. And this is paravertebral space, as I told you before. It's very important. This is, as I told you before, internal intercostal membrane continues with superior costal transverse ligament, okay? And both are the same. And you have many nerve here. As I told you, when you inject in paravertebral space, it's very near to intervertebral foramen and epidural space, okay? And always put your probe perpendicular to the ribs. We have rib here and put it perpendicular. And when you receive to the transverse process, transverse process has like this, they are oblique. So you must uh, turn the tip of your probe cephalate to be perpendicular to both transverse process. See this? Okay. This is the sonar anatomy. I put probe on the transverse process and uh, turn its cephalate. To see the transverse process, you see this round space is transverse process. I want to search for hyperechoic uh, costal transverse ligament, which is between these two transverse process. This is one, this is one, this is the line between them. Search for an oblique line. This is intercostal. This is the uh, acoustic shadow of the 
ribs and this is the muscle. You see here is between internal intercostal and innermost intercostal very easily. The muscle parallel to tip of the, your rib is external intercostal. And this is a technique, uh, axial technique for paravertebral block. You put your probe uh, transversely, not longitudinally, near to transverse process as inject between transverse process and pleb. Uh, this is internal intercostal muscle. This is my choice technique because you have more space to enter your needle. And this is very similar to medial branch block in lumbar region. This is SIP transverse process this angle. This is transverse process pleb this angle. It's very easy technique, especially for patients which have a scar in the midline. And this is intercostal nerve block. This is the needle comes near to the pleb. If you could not see the muscle layer, come about near to the pleb. Maybe you can see the vessel here and enter your needle here and all the time aspirate and then inject. This is paravertebral block. See this line, hyperacuic line? This is the crystal transverse ligament. You may feel a pop. It's more thicker than internal intercostal muscle for in intercostal transverse block. And always pleb move downward in both technique and confirm that your technique is correct. You can see both as one to compare them that both are exactly the same technique. A little difference in acoustic shadow of transverse process and uh, ribs you see always Turn your propcephalate in transverse process when you receive near to a spine to have a good view of uh, costal transverse ligament. And we have also complication from this injection, absorption rate of local anesthetic, but this is more important for regional block. In anesthesia, in pain injection, you use a low concentration, low volume, even one or two level, and we have not uh, the possibility of uh, toxicity of local anesthetic. But you have to know it. And pneumothorax and infection, as I told you. And over last three years, we have many improvement in the uh, diagnosis of pathology of this chronic syndrome. And, and we have also raised awareness about the healthcare professional and the patient about the presence of the syndrome. And we have still much more work to do to improve our ability to diagnose this syndrome and help these people. And I, I'm uh, hopeful that this lecture help you and improve your uh, quality of your uh, treatment of your patient. And uh, uh, it's all. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Garazi. That was absolutely very extensive overview. Uh, we appreciate the veracity, the details, and all the... Um, pictures as well. Um, I really hope um, maybe going into the future, um, Dr. Madi will be able to organize possibly a practical session for some of us to be able to demonstrate some of these procedures as well. Hey, Thank you once more, Dr. Garazi. Now, um, there are a few questions um, that have been listed out. We're going to be very fast with this because our time is fast spent. Um, one of the questions that was asked was one, can we do cryoanalgesia post-op 
for patient having toracotomy pain? Dr. Garazzi. Hello? No, we can't hear you. I, I am muted. I'm muted. Okay. She was muted. Uh, yes, you hear okay. me? Yes. Yeah, we hear you cryo now. Thank you. Yes, cryoanalgesia. They use cryoanalgesia even after the surgery. Mm. Yes, but because of the possibility of uh, complication of uh, the blocking the nerve, cryoanalgesia of the nerve, is, uh, they recommended that they don't use it during the surgery. But Correct. for post acotomy pain syndrome, yes, you can use it. It's very useful. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Now, the other question is, um, during your presentation, you mentioned that um, one of the most important mechanisms for the pain most patients experience for post acotomy is normally coming from injuries to the intercostal nerves. Yes. Somebody asks a question, how do you prevent that from happening? Is there this any is surgical the... techniques or is there anything the surgeon can do to prevent the incidence? Some yes. are comparing yes. the use of VATS procedure and open teracotomies. Yes, there are many comparisons of the VATS and open trachotomy, and this is approved that VATS is, is better than open trachotomy because the possibility of the injury of the nerve is less. This is obvious. True. Yes. True. True. Less no, tissue injury, less, less respect to the tissue, less chronic pain. Correct. Now, uh, another person asks a question. For patient having post-hepatic neuralgia, that's epizoster, affecting the thoracic dermatomes is what is your best choice of treating such patients uh post herpetic neuralgia mm. has an algorithm itself like mm -hmm. any neuropathic pain is a neuropathic pain first conservative mm -hmm. treatment and then interventional treatment interventional mm -hmm. treatment one of them is intercostal nerve block Another mm -hmm. one is selective nerve root block. Another one is pulse mm -hmm. rate frequency of dorsal root ganglion. All of them you can use for this patient. And, and they mm -hmm. are very diff, uh, very resistant to the treatment. Post-herpetic mm -hmm. neuralgia is a difficult type of neuropathic pain okay. for management. Absolutely. Now, um, one other question somebody asked. You mentioned that instead of doing the conventional radio frequency ablation for most of the patient, you choose to do a pulse RFA for the patient. He's now asking a question. Now, what about cancer patients that are going to be dying? Do yes. you worry about deafferentation pain after conventional RFA for those no. patients? No, no, no. Okay. No. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. And the other question somebody asks as well is, what is the benefit of chemical neurolysis, use of alcohol, and phenol. If you're going to be choosing between the two, what would be your choice and at what concentrations? I don't use uh, chemical neuralysis at all because mm. you cannot control distribution of your phenol or alcohol. Okay? Mm. So mm. I don't use them and I have no experience about it. Sorry. Okay. All right. Now, um, another question. So many questions for you, Dr. Garazzi. So many questions. <laughs> Wonderful lecture you gave us. Now, somebody asked, you mentioned that there's genetic risk factor for patients developing post pain syndrome. Is yes. there any way you can identify some of the patients before they come in for surgery that they have the oh. genetic predilection? Yes, this is a very nice question. If we have mm -hmm. personalized medicine, you know today. And I have, I wrote mm. a lecture about this and will be published soon in uh, Indian Pain Journal. I uh, mm. actually, COVID uh, push out to the genetics because you know, uh, mm. chronic pain in every patient, we have a genetic predisposition to chronic pain. It, it's, it's approved. And mm. we have very diff mm. different genetic response to the drug. So in personalized medicine mm. or persistent medicine, they try to find a patient who are uh, superimposed to, this, to the chronic pain, 
or even post-thoracotomy pain, and uh, they work on the uh, genetic drugs, they work on to find this gene, and to, to gene therapy in future would be the future of chronic pain treatment. I believe in it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And Thank I think you. finally, before we go to the next lecture, somebody has asked you about intercostal infiltration. Is there any benefit of infiltrating the site of the surgery? You mentioned something very important that not all centers have access to spinal cord stimulation. Not all yeah. centers have access to DRG. What yeah. they have in their center is infiltration. What concentration yeah. of local can they use in yes. that regard? Yes, for pain management, the you can use uh, lowest concentration. For example, I use mm. 0.125% of bopivacaine or ropivacaine. About one or two uh, ml is enough, yes. And okay. in my patient, okay. Uh, I, I didn't mm -hmm. use a spinal cord stimulator or DRG stimulation because it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. We have not this ability in our country. True. And none of my patients True. need to this uh, expensive uh, instrument. Absolutely. We can, you can control Absolutely. your patient, repeat the injection. Every, mm -hmm. when your patient have okay. again the patient refer to you and repeat the injection or, or even use oh, okay. uh, radio frequency or even use phenol or alcohol chemical neuralizes if it's, it's not if you have not other possibility of use another instrument. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. Fantastic. Um, we just want to thank um, Dr. Garazi for the very outstanding lecture you've given us. Thank you for the fantastic overview. Um, I'm sure um, uh, the the big organizers of this meeting, um, Dr. Madi and group. We're going to organize a practical session. We can Absolutely. actually demonstrate how some of this block can be done. I want Absolutely. to say big congratulations to Dr. Wide, Dr. Madi. Thank you so much for this amazing work you're doing. And Dr. Garazi, once again, thank you. Thank you.